Beautiful and quaint Shepherdstown, West Virginia is home to the famous Bridge Gallery. The gallery has featured exhibitions of some of the most prominent artists in Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. It comes as no surprise that patrons come from hundreds of miles away to see the work of these celebrated artists. One such artist is Evan Bogus. Evan studied at the prestigious Hofberger School of Painting and the Studio Art Center in Florence, Italy. Bogus claims that heat, time, and pressure have formed Earth's metamorphic elements. In addition to that, they've also guided his abstractions. Bogus excavates pressure, heat, and time out of the context of mineralogy and translates them into the language of painting. Pressure becomes the illusory depth in the pictorial space. Heat becomes a property of color, and time becomes the gradual accumulation of paint on a surface. A fascinating pictorial concept for sure. In addition to being a working artist, Bogus is also an instructor of aesthetics and art criticism at Shepherd University. You talk about uh, time, shape, and pressure, and heat, mm -hmm. and the formulation of certain uh, geometric shapes. And How does that interplay in your work? Well, the project was to see how I could translate those conditions of pressure, heat, and time into um, a, a kind of an armature for developing abstraction. Uh, you know, heat, we, we describe color a lot of times through warmth and, and coolness. That, that seemed to be a, a, an immediate matchup. Time is necessary in painting, and it's, it's one of the key elements that, that goes into it. It's what, it's, my favorite part of painting is, is the aspect of time. Uh, and then uh, pressure. And I was thinking about pressure as sort of a lateral depth in the painting. Is it, do I want there to be an implied shallow relief, or do I want, to, I want the space to be really, really deep behind it, so that, that compacting element in the, in the visual space. Um, but going back to time, I, I started with that. I, I, I sort of set out a, uh, an amount of time for each painting, and so that that wouldn't just be something that was at the service of the other elements of the, of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, I was, I was using that, that visual language to describe, both in abstraction and in realism, uh, minerals themselves, and I would start with one small little precious thing and then extrapolate it through those, those different uh, aspects, the pressure, heat, and time, um, as I was using it. How does one begin to observe that and knowingly put it into your work? Uh, as a viewer or as, as myself? As an artist, how do you do that? Uh, that? That's the most unique thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, you're sort of channeling nature itself. That's the idea, is, is that I'm, I'm using the, this, uh, this mineral specimen to arrive at a completely different mineral. Um, using its own system or formula, uh, visually, not chemically or anything. So like the that. elements table has expanded since you started painting. For me, it has, mm -hmm. and and of course, when when people look at this, I realize that a large part of that is anecdotal. That 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 them seeing those things in the painting might not come through as clearly as as they do for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm not one who can just attack a painting without a plan. I, I, need, I need that substructure to, to kind of guide me and, and push me in the direction that I want to go. You think of gravity, it's, it's a, varying, a varying degree, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about pressure, I think gravity. Uh -huh. And then I think the pressure from within and the pressure from without. Is that in your mind? It, I, was, I, I struggled with the idea of pressure, uh, trying to figure out what I wanted from it. And the pictorial depth is always something that I've, I've struggled with, but I've, I've approached it in a way that, that wasn't very, um, uh, there were no preconditions to it. And so that's, real, that's where I, I decided to go with the, the issue of pressure, is that, that pictorial depth. How much do I want it to look compressed? The more it compresses, the flatter the, the image gets. And I think that's a nice combination, that's a, that's a nice, uh, description of, of, of how uh, an image works. You talk about layers of imagery in your paintings. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm an English teacher, so when I teach imagery, I try to explain that it's just not pictorial. I mean, all your senses create imagery. They right. do create the pictures themselves. I know this is out there, but is when I look at your work, do I 
get a sense of a sound creating a picture? Do I get a sense of a smell, a taste, a touch? Are they at play here? Maybe. Um, I, those aren't things that really pop up in my head while I'm painting. I'm, okay. I'm almost purely visual when, okay. I'm, when I'm thinking. But as uh, you can recognize it now. As I can recognize it now, but I'm not going to take that off the table as being yeah. part of it. I, you know, there are always things operating in the background that I don't have access to. Do you paint with music? Uh, I, I do, uh, and then, well, I used to. I, recently, I like there to be absolute silence when I'm painting. Uh, it allows me to think out loud a little bit better. Because sounds can create images. And so that can, be, that can be somewhat dismaying if it's not what you want. That's right. right. Well, sound visualization is, is uh, there's, there's a lot of you know, frequency and things like that. The visualization of frequency, I, I like those things. And for a while, I was, uh, I was using a different structure for abstraction. I was looking at, at sort of the invisible world and the, uh, the way that we build machines to give us a crude description of that thing that we don't have biological access to. Uh, and so things like sound and, and, and uh, magnetic fields and things like that, I was, I was examining that too. You sound like a scientist. I, I'm, I don't have authority over any of those things. I, have, yeah. I, have, I, I latch onto something and I, I run with it as far as it'll, it'll take me and then I'll, I'll move on to something yeah. else. Just from reading art history, you know, when abstract art took, began to take form, I mean, it was seen as somewhat interesting, but really not recognizably great art. I mean, I think John Ruskin would have probably, he tried to lock up Whistler for his nocturnals. <laughs> I think he probably would have had a heart attack had he been alive to see abstract art. But let's not forget that some of the great abstract artists, yourself included, are also figurative artists and have classical training and classical background. And when you bring that kind of training to abstract art, you have true brilliance, I think. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd include myself among the... the oh, no, the you are great. But um, really are. I, I do believe that, that it never hurts to know that stuff. It, it never hurts to, to understand the discipline that, that it takes to arrive at a form, um, a, an observed form. I, I think that that can only help uh, an artist's understanding. If, uh, and I, I, I started off as, uh, in figure composition. I, that's, that's where I, my love affair with art sort of started off. Uh, and, and so I, I, still, I still love it. I still look at it as a, as a source of, of of reference for what I do. And a lot of times when I'm dealing with abstraction or something that is sort of free form and, and developing, I think of it as a figure. I, th I think mm -hmm. of, of the sort of the central mass of the imagery in terms of, of a figure composition because that's what I, that's what I started with. So that's you just reorganize the matter, crumple it, and kind then of. expand it, yeah. and you have abstract. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these abstractions have legs. They have arms. They have mm -hmm. torsos. But then, you know, other processes have their effect on that, and it kind of gets chiseled away at a certain point. Bogus is the supervisor of the Phase Two Fine Arts Building at Shepherd University. He's also a professor at Shepherd and teaches painting. We caught up with him at the start of the semester, and he explained the arts projects the students were just beginning to delve into. To give the students uh, the challenge of, of, of addressing an, an object from direct observation, painting from direct observation, uh, something that is not easily identifiable in either color or form. So these small specimens uh, that they've sculpted don't really represent anything recognizable. And color behaves on them in very subtle ways, and so the challenge is to, be, to make a convincing painting of something that's unrecognizable but follows the logic of light. I'm really glad that you've decided to artificially crop there. I'll show you how to trim this off when you're all done and this is all dry. But that, that was a good decision. A couple things that it does though is it puts a high priority on this shadow. That's completing that right side of the, the composition. And it's creating this really cool open form. Even though 
this isn't an actual object. It's behaving like one. But I actually like how you're painting through here. Each individual brush mark is important and it means something uh, distinct from all the other brush marks around it. In this case, you're actually going for muddiness. You don't want to be able to say, well, that's a, that's a light blue or that's a light purple or that's a light red or a light yellow. All the colors are, are, are extremely muted on purpose. So don't worry about preserving the, uh, preserving the hue at all. You're really just going for a value range that leans warm and then a value range that leans uh, cold. What I think it is about painting that, that, um, that, that attracts students is its, its slowness, it, its speed. We're slowing down life. Yeah. I like to think we're slowing down aging too, you know we talked about <laughs> That's that. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. we don't know that for sure. Right. Well, I, we, maybe we feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where, where everything else is moving so fast, I think painting is a very good way of, of uh, understanding what's happening around you and, and allowing your ideas to change about a given subject over a period of time. And if, and if you're good, a record of, of that change is evident in the work. I think that's an appealing that's thing. That's interesting. It's individual quiet and solitude, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A world away from the world. But it can be used to make something very loud and noisy. True. And I, I like that duality of it. True, very true. Well, let's take a look at the wall. Sure. This one is called nystagmus. Mm -hmm. And you say, that is an eye condition. Um, it has to do with uh, how your eye moves between focal points. Interesting. So in addition to all the other things that I'm interested in mm -hmm. and all the other uh, tangents that I get into, uh, I was looking at, I was researching, um, so motion tra uh, eye tracking software and how that develops uh, a composition on its own. And so I was trying to see whether or not a good composition through eye tracking software will lead to another good composition. So if the line works sort of through all of Bryce Martin or something like that, would, uh, would generate its own composition. And so I was, I was using this tracing line as a way of suggesting where the eye might move throughout the course of, of a composition. And uh, using that also to obscure or uh, push back the, the source composition. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, but, oh, no, definitely. Uh, no, you can see it. it, it it's almost jelly-like. It's somewhat mm -hmm. fluid as yeah. it expands. So the way that, that your, your eyes work is that they don't just move directly from a focal point to a focal point or a point of interest to a point of interest. Mm -hmm. They make all these little flips and, and swirls on their way there. It's really fast, it's super fast. But it's there, and it's a way of us taking in all over the, our, our entire environment in, in between our, our interest points. So I, I like the suggestion that I was getting through some of the, the research that I was, I was doing, um, looking at the lines that we're developing. I thought that was an interesting component to it, how that complemented things that were happening on, on a composition without completely overriding the composition. They sort of interacted, but they were their own separate thing. Um, in addition to that, I'm, I'm always thinking about the process of painting through the lens of, of photo editing software, because mm -hmm. I just can't escape that. It's just, no, you can't. It's just everywhere now. And so the layering process has a lot to do with that. The, the great and white checkered board is a direct reference to that, and, and it signifies sort of the base level. You can't go any further past that. But time will tell. But then I break that. Then I push yes. past that yes, just to, just to see what's there. Yeah. I'm continually fascinated as we move on by the yellow object and what, that's, what, what that actually signifies. But to me, it would be different than perhaps another viewer. But I just think that's the most beautiful thing in the entire painting, is that huh. one yellow image. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's flower-like, but at the same time, it's birth and regrowth, and, and there's a focus to it. Yeah, it's Do beautiful. Do you want me to tell you what it really is? 
Pardon me? Do you want to know what it really is? Well, I'm, I'm not supposed to literalize, but if you want yeah. to tell me, yeah. It's a, it's a rubber kitchen glove. <laughs> uh, it was... Now everybody's laughing at me. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's a rubber kitchen glove. Well, there's, yes, we did literalize it, but <laughs> it works. Um, and that's, that's kind of the point, is I wanted something that, be, that in its own form would behave like the lines that were going to go on top of it. I actually have a pair of yellow kitchen gloves in the car. <laughs> to change bulbs with in, in lights. Isn't that ironic? Yeah. Let's take a look at this big one here. This was a, a mammoth undertaking. Uh, it's gone through several stages. Uh -huh. uh, it was in the, uh, the Clay Center over the summer at the Juliet Art Museum uh, wow. without the fish. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Uh, when it came back, I, I added the fish to it. Uh -huh. uh, it. This bottom area seemed a little under considered. So. What made you add that particular image, do you think? Where did that come from? I, that's, that's very literal. I started doing a, a series of, of fish paintings. Uh, well, not necessarily fish paintings, but paintings of trophy mounts. Um, so deceased fish that had been, you know, taxidermy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I started painting them because I, I liked how they were, they simultaneously felt mechanical and organic at the same time. There's aspects, there's certain planes and facets on the fish that, that look, uh, look mechanical or, or, or robotic almost, and then other parts that, that fade out into something else. Uh, the space that I painted was intended to look kind of cavernous, and so I'm using references to um, mineralogy and geology throughout all of these, and it seemed like that it needed an inhabitant at some level. That's beautiful work. Thank you. Now my favorite. Let's do this one. This just exemplifies how good you are at figurative painting. Oh, and there's one you. particular one on your website of a woman that's just beautiful. Oh, you thank know, you. That, that, that with a darker background to it. It's just, mm -hmm. I mean, it captures that person. Oh, thank you. It really captures that person. Thank you. Um, tell me about this one. So again, I was, I was uh, looking at what are called saccade lines, um, those little flips and, and doodles that your eye makes between focal points. And I was, uh, I was thinking about how that, that functions in a wide number of, of environments and circumstances and events. So tennis, what is your eye? What, what kind of movements can we see in, in that game? Like, does that itself kind of suggest a composition on its own? certain kinds of physical behaviors in the world might uh, lend themselves to a, a different kind of composition. So it, again, it's just another way of, of uh, for me to, um, to build an armature for myself, to develop an abstraction or a system for abstraction instead of uh, just taking an image and distorting it somehow. I'm, I'm interested in these other, these other methods. The Bridge Gallery in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, recently housed exhibitions by pottery artist Joy Bridie, prominent artists David Bettini, Tim Clayton, and Evan Bogus, as well as well-known photographers Benita Keller and Mark Muse. Just an average month in the life of the Bridge Gallery, according to owner and curator Catherine Burns. Catherine, you've always been involved in art most of your life. You studied art, you studied art history, you knew you'd be immersed in it in some way throughout your life. What brought you to the Bridge Gallery in Shepherdstown, West Virginia? Well, it was a progression of studying and then uh, working with art consultants in Washington area. And opportunities came up uh, to take over clients. And I, I spent a lot of time working with interior designers in the city. And it just, uh, an opportunity came up that the owner of this building, who had run a gallery here for about 12 years, and I had a working relationship with him, uh, offered me the opportunity to rent the space, and I took it. Mm -hmm. This is a very arch-rich community here in both Shepherdstown and in West Virginia, and as you say, in close proximity to Washington, D.C., there's never a lack of artists to display, is there? That's, that's 
absolutely true. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of artists and there are a lot of art groups that uh, show at all over the place. So no shortage, absolutely not. So having a Leonardo da Vinci in Washington, D.C. in the National Gallery of Art certainly attracts a lot of artists from around the world to paint within these 100 miles, doesn't it? I think it does. Mm -hmm. Shepherdstown also, though, seems to have a little creative vortex, a lot of artists and musicians and creative people, theater people, mm -hmm. uh, are attracted to this area. When did you first come to Shepherdstown? Uh, 1987, mm -hmm. my husband Michael uh, went to Shepherd College here years and years ago and when it was time to settle down and buy a house and settle into a community, this is, this is where he wanted to go. And I had visited here because I went to the University of Maryland, so I was familiar with the town. How many showings do you have here a year? actual exhibits where you bring in various artists? Mm, probably about uh, 11, 10 to 11. And uh, we do a couple charity events also for the local animal shelter where we, we just show donated items and recycled art and that's a lot of fun. But I would say almost every five to six weeks we have something new. The symbolism connected with a bridge can be pretty dramatic. Did you name the gallery? I did. Why did you name it a bridge? Well, uh, I, I literally looked through an encyclopedia waiting, looking for one word to just strike me as something that would be speak as to what I wanted this place to be. And there was a couple of reasons why I took the bridge. And one was we are a community of bridges. They're everywhere. And also, ultimately, it was the idea of connectivity. I wanted, we connect artists to the community. We are the bridge. You see all kinds of people trod these boards in this gallery. It must be fascinating when you have these showings to watch the expressions on their faces and reactions when they see essentially art for the very first time in their life. Things that have been created that heretofore have never been seen before. That must be fascinating to see. It is. There's an interplay, isn't there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get to see people fall in love, <laughs> you know, and just <laughs> have the, just want to possess something, just so enthralled with what they're seeing, yes. What is it about that when you look at a painting and I have to have that? Yeah. What is it that goes on inside the body? Is it? I don't know. I call it the desire to possess, you know, where they there just. There you go. They just, a lot of times people will resist that and they come back and they can't get it out of their mind that they saw something that touched them, that reached them, and they want it in their lives. Or something that they couldn't explain and literalize. And all of a sudden there was a mystery for the very first time in their lives that they couldn't debunk. And they wanted to be part of that. Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. That's abstract art. I mean, you immerse yourself and you don't know where you end up. Absolutely true. Yeah, as opposed to realism. Do you have a favorite genre? Have you ever thought about it? Do you like realism? Do you like modern art, uh, surrealism? I really, I really love and appreciate all of it. I, it's hard to select one. I am strongly attracted to abstract art. I, mm -hmm. I love emotional quality of it and um, I, that might be something that I would say was my favorite but I, I'm also very attracted to realism and photography and sculpture and ceramics so it's all good. One can imagine your house is probably full of art. Mostly my husband's, he was a painter. There you go, well <laughs> so. that doesn't hurt. Well that would be very difficult to take down. Yeah, yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's some kind of transition. You probably are aware of this. When you see a young person in the gallery at a show and what they react to versus that of, say, someone middle-aged and then someone of later years, they're all reacting to things differently in different time frames. And for me, it started with realism. Then, believe it or not, impressionism. Mm -hmm. And then this little transformation into some things that were sort of considered modern art. Mm -hmm. 
and then I moved into sort of whimsical surrealism and then I've gone into abstract art now because I feel as if that abstract art is an unanswered question as to what it is, where I'm going, and how I see it. And I want life to be like that. That from that's a journey. Do you see uh, different people going on different journeys? And is there any way to compartmentalize that? Um, there are a few people that I've, I've seen change or evolve, but um, a lot of times people have a favorite thing and see, they seem to be attracted to a particular thing. I can't say I've seen a lot of that. Thank you for joining us on National Arts. Until next time, remember, art was meant to be appreciated, so you be a part of it.